What if you were playing shoots and ladders and you were literally taught that a ladder was a shoot and a shoot was a ladder? <laughs> well, financially, monetarily, legally, that's the exact equivalent <laughs> because we were taught completely inverted. Learning the rules to the game is so important. You escape when you don't know the rules to the game. When you understand how to use debt in your favor and you understand how to use the straw man in your favor, why would you run off grit? You're even more empowered now. On the light side, there is just service to others love, connection to all that is. That is a sustainable long-term strategy. You look at the energetic of the self-servience, that over time is not. We are the path of unity, the, the positive polarity. We actually are one. We actually care about each other. And that's a trait that the negative path doesn't share. They're not connected in the way you think. The more that the positive path gains unity and harmony, the more divided the negative path will be. It is very lazy to just go, them, Elon, the deep state, Illuminati, our mission is helping people see through duality and understand that whether we're talking about shadow aspects of our own psyche or shadow aspects of the entire human race, it all is love and it all is leading us one step closer to a new earth. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another inspiring and exciting episode with me and my man, Aaron Abke, on The Great Awakening Show. This is a show where we take you guys on the journey of humanity's evolution of its consciousness in real time. As usual, we're going to be going through the few different segments of our show. We're each going to bring one piece of positive news. We're each going to outline two to three reaction clips that both Aaron and myself have not seen yet. So those are always fun. Discuss the spiritual and 3D implications of them. And then as always, we'll come full circle, tie everything together and give you each a prediction that we have either for next month or the near future as it pertains to humanity's timeline, whether that be spiritually or more in a material sense. So my first reaction clip is actually two separate clips. And I apologize in advance because all my reaction clips are Instagram reels <laughs> this month. So you're gonna see the vertical video, but I wanna play you two different videos that are on the same topic. But um, these are reels that I came across uh, in the last month that I'm like, man, it's amazing to me how we're seeing more and more of this content surfacing on the interwebs and social media and like just normal people sharing content like this. It's uh, really exciting. So I'll play the first one, then I'll play the second one. They're in the business of purchasing securities. That's it. So you say, okay, don't, you know, confuse me with all that legalese. You know, I want a loan. I want a loan. Fine. Here's the loan contract. Here's the offer letter and you sign. At law, it's very clear you have issued a security, namely the promissory note, and the bank is going to purchase that. That's what's happening. Put it in language term. What does that mean? It means that um, what the bank is doing is very different from what it presents to the public that it's doing. How does this fit together? So you say, fine, if the bank purchases my promissory note, but how do I get my money? I want, you know, so oh, I, I want 200 money. grand. Right? Yeah, I don't care about the details, I want the money. The bank will say, well, you find it in your account with us. That would be technically correct. If they say, we'll transfer it to your account, that's wrong because no money is transferred at all so really from right. anywhere inside the bank or outside the bank. Why? Because what we call a deposit is simply the bank's record of its debt to the public. Now it also owes you money, and its record of the money it owes you is what you think you're getting as money. And that's all it is. So what they just talked about there was what we talked about last week with depositing money in your account and banks pretend to be holders of money when they're actually uh, purchasers of securities, meaning everything I give them, they're taking it for themselves and they're giving me fake credit in my account. And that's not the same thing, like actual legal tender is not the same thing as credit, right? It's like imaginary money. And so it's a good way to start thinking about banks. And then this one kind of goes in tandem with it. So I'll just play it real quick. Cash value that was used from the bank loan check 
came directly from the borrower and that the bank received the funds from the alleged borrower for free. This is true. Is it the bank's policy to transfer actual cash value from the alleged borrower to the bank and then keep the funds in the bank's property, which they then loan out as bank loans as if they actually own, owned it and loaned their own money? Yes. <laughs> Was it the bank's intent to receive actual cash value from the borrower and return the value of the funds back to the borrower as a loan? Yes. Do you believe that it was the borrower's intent to fund his own bank loan check? Oh, man. I love right, that brother. clip where the guy's like, the, the, whoever the defendant is, who's forced to answer these questions in open court, and he's just like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, painful so to answer. I've seen... Uh, I've seen both of those excellent clips and um, of course you have. Here's my <laughs> Give us your thoughts anyway. Here's my thoughts on this. No, it's better that I've seen them. Um, yeah. This is like, you know, there's only so many like fire clips in the sovereignty space. It's true. So Good it's point. like it's not like news or something. So I want you guys to think of what's a common game that people play when they're growing up. Let's say Candyland. Okay, so let's say Candyland. When you were a kid and you were learning how to play Candyland, imagine if your friend who wanted you to play with them or your parents who were or who were first playing with you set up Candyland and then proceeded to start the game and never taught you the rules. <laughs> that, that is a... Uh, Welcome to the world. That is what happens with uh, our legal and financial systems. Really every system, but the ones that are most plaguing us and the average person has no clue about are the legal and financial systems. And so, you know, when I watch clips like that, it's kind of hard to give uh, a shocked reaction because at this point I've, you know, <laughs> that's just considered normal to me. Mm -hmm. Um, but I can imagine the vast majority of people that come across that, I don't even think could have a shocked reaction because they're just confused. They're trying to learn. They're probably just like, wait, what? What is yeah. that? How does that, that's not possible type thing. And it's like, well, what if you were playing shoots and ladders and you were literally taught that a ladder was a shoot and a shoot was a ladder? <laughs> Such so a you good were analogy. So you were playing the game like for anyone who hasn't played ladders are what you want to hit cuz it skips you up. It's like, you know, you get way ahead. Mm -hmm. But if you accidentally land on a shoot, sends you back. Well, financially, monetarily, legally, we can think of this notion of our straw man, right? And this notion of we've been taught as we've been indoctrinated that we're debtors and that they're creditors, and that they have value, and that we don't, and that they we issue need us them. The money. Yeah, it's it's all of this notion of like, we need them. Mm -hmm. That's the exact equivalent of playing the game, and our entire lives, we've been literally aiming for and trying to land on a shoot <laughs> so we can get sent back, <laughs> yeah, because wow. we were taught completely inverted, right? Mm-hmm. You are a huge teacher of this. The dark side is really just what? The inversion of truth? Yeah. So why would this system be any different? And, um, you know, so you see these videos and it's like, you know, the comments, you got a lot of people who are like, this is true. And then you got a lot of people who are like, you know, you're literally crazy. But it just goes to show like this reality is, you know, a simulation we can't really prove otherwise. And there are rules to every game. Yeah. And so my whole thing in the work that I do and the content that I put out is like, it would behoove you to learn the rules. <laughs> now, learning the rules is not the same as saying you have to become a rogue mercenary. You have to start, you know, living off grid with burner phones <laughs> and all this different stuff. <laughs> There's many, many levels to it, right? Mm -hmm. Just because you learn, oh, shit, I'm actually the creditor and you start to learn how to read law and you can actually understand the different codes that are right in plain sight. 
it doesn't mean you have to necessarily, you know, stop using fiat and no longer have a phone and no longer have a credit card and no longer participate. But what it does do is it gives you the gift of choice. Mm -hmm. And yep. to explain this spiritually, it's no different than making the transition from victim consciousness to creator consciousness. What's the difference between a victim and a creator? The creator acknowledges they have the gift of choice. A victim pretends they don't. Yet both are choosing that reality. And financially in commerce, it is no different. If you choose not to learn these things, then what do you do? You continue to acquiesce. Yeah. Legal term for essentially accepting terms and conditions because you didn't contest them. Right? So they assume, oh, well, you're agreeing to this. And so I, I really very much so view it in the same way. And I, and I like to use those parallels because it's all the same. I think this stuff can sound complex and overwhelming when you're new to it and be like, oh, wonderful, another rabbit hole. But it's like, no, every system you look at, and this is what I do for a living, studying the different systems, it's all the same one trick. It's just let's invert the truth, teach them black means white and white means black, and you got them. Yeah. That's, that's like yeah. a very simple strategy. And so odds are what you've been taught close to something like the exact opposite of it is actually what happened. Whether we're talking about history, whether we're talking about certain facts, whether we're talking about science, whether we're talking about a system at large or your uh, the part you play in that system at large. And so... As I look at these clips, it's very much so like if you're new to this information, um, empower yourself, spend some time to learn the basics. Once again, that doesn't mean you have to go off, you know, and completely change your life path. Some of you will, you know, it definitely altered mine, but oh, yeah. I think this information scares people because it's like, well, what would it mean if I knew this? Like I would have to do X, Y, Z. And it's like, no, you would just have the gift of choice. I'm going to use one more analogy and then I'm going to hand it off to you. <laughs> when you study high performers, the 1% of any industry discipline, you notice a theme. They're driven by their demons very, very often. True. Yeah. Very often. And this is, something that's, this is something that stood out to me because I've been studying the 1% ever since I was a teenager because I was always just, I don't know, I, I just admired greatness, almost like... I see it as art. I see it as divinity. Mm -hmm. Totally. And so I just always like to study greatness in different areas. And long before it was about money, I was just interested in studying anyone who was the best at anything and learning. And so I noticed this trend over and over and over and the implications of it as it relates to uh, myself. Well, I, I quickly realized, well, shit, well, I don't want to, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be tormented. And that's what's driving my, you know, achievement or my success and such. And so I venture on this path of healing. And, and one of the things that comes up when you start your healing work is you start realizing, well, shit, my fuel source has been darkness. It's been my demons. And there's this aspect of you that likes that, that doesn't want to let that go. And so, so what comes up is there's this immense fear that I've personally dealt with. And I'm happy to be on the other side of, but I really didn't transcend it until I was 28 and I had a little early midlife crisis when I reached a point where I didn't financially really have to work anymore. And it, I realized that what had been driving me that entire time was not what my spiritual ego um, thought or wanted. It was still some of these demons. And when you go through this healing process, your ego's number one fear is, well, if I really heal and transcend this trauma, then I'll lose my edge. I'll lose the very thing that makes me special. Right. And what I ultimately had to learn, and I've also heard Tony Robbins talk about this, is healing your core traumas, the ones that literally shaped you into your personality type, does not regress you or cause you to lose your edge. You know what it does? It gives you the gift of choice. You can still be extremely competitive. You can still be extremely social. You could still be very influential or charismatic. 
all of these character attributes came from trauma. They were an adaptation to pain. And so you learned to adapt to your environment this way to get your needs met unconsciously as a child. But we play that tape over and over and over to the point where we lose the ability to choose anymore. And we, most of us call that our personality. We say things like, this is just the way I am. No, it's not. That's trauma with repetition. And so I know that's kind of a tangent, but I say that to bring in a different lens, kind of a trauma-informed lens for those who that will resonate with of like the same way healing your trauma doesn't mean you have to let go of all of the positive things that the adaptation brought into your life. It just gives you the gift of choice. And that's kind of counterintuitive. I view this stuff as the same. It doesn't benefit you to not go into it because you're afraid and you're identifying with what your ego is telling you would happen if you went into it. I think it's mm -hmm. very important that everyone learn the, get the rules to the game. It doesn't mean anything other than you'll gain the gift of choice. Mm -hmm. That is all. What do you think, <laughs> brother? <laughs> Dude, so I, I chose those clips not because I thought you would have a reaction to them, more so for the audience to like see those clips as living proof that these principles we always talk about are true, that yep. debt is really credit, credit's really debt, uh, shoots and ladders, as you said. Um, but I, I gave those clips to you because I wanted to get one of your knowledge bombs, wisdom bombs on that topic, and uh, my plan worked to perfection. <laughs> Thank you for that transmission. I know um, you did. <laughs> <laughs> You're in my head. Um, what I was thinking when you were talking about shoots and ladders, that's a perfect analogy for debt and credit. Everything we've been told is a debt is actually credit and vice versa. And like learning the rules to the game, when you made that point, having that choice is so important because like the example you gave of somebody who goes to live off grid with three burner phones and Faraday cages and trying to get as unplugged as possible. I wouldn't say every single time somebody does that, but I would say the majority of the time people are choosing to do that. It's because they don't have the choice because they don't know the rules to the game right? You Literally. escape when you don't know the rules to the game. When you understand how to use debt in your favor, when you understand how to use the straw man in your favor, why would you run off off grid? Can You're you say even that more again? Empowered now. <laughs> What's that? That first part, that's uh, it's very important for people to understand what you just said. <laughs> you said you escape when you don't know the rules to the game. Isn't it true? It is very true. I don't think people understand that though, Aaron. And how many ways do we try to escape too? Not just yeah, going there's, off there's grid. There's levels to that. Yeah. Levels to unpack. Yeah. What you guys heard in that second clip was an actual court case. And you probably could tell that, but that was an actual court case where uh, it might've even been um, the African-American guy who sued the banks for his mortgage and won because he proved, basically he did a validation of debt on them. And he, wow. he made them prove in open court, you guys didn't loan me anything. You guys took my money out of my SESTQV trust, loaned it to me, lied and said it was a debt, and then told me to pay you back. And that attorney in that case is asking the defendant, like, do you think that my client wanted to be loaned his own money? And he's like, oh, no. <laughs> uh, do you think he believed you were loaning him your own capital rather than his? Yes. You know, just so begrudgingly answering these questions because this is the big secret that only the people at the top levels understand how this game is played. And that's why they don't want these things to go to court because they don't want precedent being set. And uh, every so often these things do make it into court and they're quickly, shh, a lot of them actually, a lot of them, I don't know if you know this, Jeremy, but a lot of these court cases where these kinds of topics are getting discussed, they won't even make record of them. The court case disappears, the judge just settles it and it disappears from the record. Because they're like, ah, we just can't have this on the record, you know? So this is powerful information you guys are receiving here. The number one topic that across all of recent history, no matter what wars are happening, no matter what's going on, the one Sweet thing mustache. you're not supposed to pay attention to. Because the Super Bowl is a distraction. Celebrity drama is a distraction. Mainstream politics reporting is a distraction on both the left and the right. Because the one thing you're not supposed to pay attention to is the reason why the top 1%'s wealth share is increasing every year and everyone else's wealth share is decreasing every year? The answer is the banks and Wall Street's decades-long crime spree. So today I'm gonna to introduce you to one of the most important of the big four banks that you probably wouldn't think is so important. 
because BlackRock gets all the conspiracy hype and JP Morgan is by far the biggest. But when I started digging into it, Citibank actually stood out in a big mm -hmm. way. And we'll come back to this later, but Citigroup stock is actually in a really precarious position. Ever since 2008, when their stock crashed hard, they've never recovered. Their stock used to be worth over $500 wow. per share. It is now worth about $50 per share. But what first got my attention was their board of directors. See, most of the big banks have boards of directors that are loaded with people that have been executives and board members at other big corporations, a lot of financial institutions. But Citibank's board of directors is filled with ex-government officials, ex-regulators, ex-CIA. Citibank is the definition of the revolving door. Take Grace Daly, for example the former senior deputy comptroller for bank supervision policy and chief national bank examiner for the OCC. She worked from 2001 to 2020 in the office of the comptroller. The office of the comptroller and the currency charters, regulates, and supervises all national banks and federal savings associations. They are the top of the food chain when it comes to regulating big banks. And it's not just that. Grace. They've also got John Dugan, who was the head of the office of the comptroller of the currency from 05 to 2010. I made a whole video about Leslie Ireland, who worked at the CIA for more than 30 years, both in Bro. senior positions, as well as in classified positions for her whole early career, which I can only assume is like a field operative. But then we've also got Renee from the Carlisle Group, who's on the board of Oracle, which is the backbone of the CIA's cyber operations. We've got counts on foreign relations, federal reserve boards, defense contractors. Wall Street on Parade has reported on Citigroup extensively because since the year 2000, they've been convicted of breaking the law 181 times, totaling up to $27 billion <laughs> of fines. That is seven and oh a half offenses goodness. per year. Their biggest fines ever were $7 billion. They've even pled guilty to criminal prosecutions with the DOJ. And when you start digging through the crimes they've been convicted of, you realize that they specialize in money laundering and hiding money in Just foreign wait, accounts for governments, for billionaires, for corporations. Between 07 and at least 2012, Banamex USA, a subsidiary of Citigroup, processed more than 30 million remittance transactions to a total value of more than $8.8 .8 billion. They issued more than 18,000 alerts, alerts for transactions that seem sketchy, but conducted fewer than 10 investigations and filed only nine suspicious activity reports, meaning 18,000 sketchy transactions came through their bank and they filed only nine official reports about it. And that's because they were laundering money for Raul Salinas, the brother of then president of Mexico, Carlos Salinas. This is what they do for all their clients. They established a shell company with layers of disguised ownership. City Trust in the Cayman Islands activated a Cayman Islands shell corporation called a PIC or private investment corporation. Then they used Panamanian shell companies to function as the board of directors for that shell company. Then they used other shell companies to serve as the officers and principal shareholders of that shell company. All of this so that Selena's name did not appear anywhere on the incorporation papers for the original shell company. Back in the 90s, they laundered more than $67 million from Mexico into these shell companies. And Ms. Elliott, the Citibank representative that was in charge of this money laundering scheme, wrote to her colleagues in June of 1993 that the Salinas accounts is, become, is turning into an exciting, profitable one for us all. Many thanks for making me look good. When they got caught, Senator Levin pressed her on the matter. The day after Mr. Salinas was arrested, you said the following, quote, everybody was on board on this. I mean, this goes in the very, very top of the corporation. This was known, okay, on the very top. He asked, who were you referring to when you said this goes to the very top? Miss Elliott replied, Bill Rhodes. I am sitting four or five down from the chairman, and Bill Rhodes was and is the vice chairman of the bank. To me, that's pretty top. Meaning Citibank, right from the top level executives, their business model is to make shitloads of money laundering huge sums of money for regimes, for anyone who wants to launder money. The Panama Papers made it clear just how good they are at doing this and broke down the whole structure of the scheme. Once a person becomes a client of a private bank, the bank's primary goal generally has been to service that client. And servicing a private bank client almost always means using services that are also the tools of money laundering, like secret trusts, offshore accounts, secret named accounts, and shell companies called private investment corporations. Private banks actually keep pre-packaged PICs on the shelf awaiting activation when a private bank client wants one. So they just have a whole bunch of ready-to-go money laundering operations waiting in storage until someone asks to get money laundered, and then they pull them out and activate them. 
in the brochure for Citibank's private bank on their international trust services, in the table of contents, it lists the attractiveness of secrecy jurisdictions, the Bahamas, the Cayman Islands, Jersey, and Switzerland, the best of all worlds. Quote, PIC assets are registered in the name of the PIC, and your ownership of the PIC need not appear in any public registry. That's how they advertise their services. Citibank is the fourth biggest bank when it comes to U.S.-based domestic deposits meaning our money deposited in the bank. JP Morgan has more than $2 trillion of our deposits. Citibank has only $760 billion. But if you look a little closer, out of all the biggest banks, they have the highest percentage of foreign assets under management, as in percentage of domestic assets, U.S. assets in the U.S. The other big banks are almost all U.S. business. Citibank is almost half foreign asset. And when you look at domestic branches versus foreign branches, Citibank has way more foreign branches than anyone else. You know, the kind of foreign branches you might have in places like the Bahamas to help facilitate money laundering outside the U.S. So here's where we go from facts and hard evidence to speculation and questions. And I need your guys' help because I'm seeing kind of a con. Wow. My man does his homework. He's an excellent investigative journalist, like basically just does his own thing on uh, IG. See what I mean? Like that's real journalism. Yeah. Just to connect that many dots, like <laughs> corporate press will like not even have a person do any research on a story. They'll just drive their news truck to the location where the story's happening and just stand out in front and give whatever opinion piece their boss told them to give. Yep. It's like none, none of that's journalism though. Yeah. You know, so anyway, I love what he's breaking down there because it gives me some really interesting thoughts. Um, most people watching this don't fall into this camp of believing that um, extremely high levels of financial collusion uh, happen on a daily basis in almost every big corporation you can think of. It happens like you wouldn't even imagine. And most people go, yeah, that's probably true. But there's still a lot of people that go, oh, come on. You think Citibank's really laundering all that money? They wouldn't risk their, their company like that. And, you know, pe companies can't just get away with stuff like that. So, like, we can solve the rationale of this with some very basic questions, which I'll pose to you, Jeremy. Um, Jeremy, is laundering money possible? Definitely. Definitely. Okay. Um, would you say that if you can figure out how to successfully launder money, that you can make lots and lots of money laundering? Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. No doubt. So then if you can make lots and lots of money at anything, but let's use laundering, don't you think it's likely that people would figure out a way to really game that system and do it at a very high level? 100%. Facts, right? So there's nothing conspiratorial about understanding that this is the way our world works, is that it's very easy to launder money and to do deceitful things with money. And he, I like how he broke down how they do it there because that's one detail I notice will often be missing when like people talk about what company or corporation is laundering money. They won't actually break down how they do it. But um, we saw it with, with Biden recently in some of the indictments of his dealings with China and um, Hunter Biden doing business deals with China, you know, 10% ten yep. for the big guy, all, that, yeah. all those emails. Uh, what they do is it's kind of like a, um, a VPN where they scatter your IP address everywhere. So that if someone's trying to trace your IP, it's like bouncing from a bunch of locations. So they can't really tell which one is where you're really at. And that's really all that people do when they launder money is they have these, like he said, shelf companies, different bank accounts, offshore accounts, trusts. And they, they literally have, and I know you know this, Jeremy, because you study the 1%, but they literally have pre-planned routes for money based on where it comes from. Uh, what type of money they're getting from what industry. They'll have pre-planned routes of like, it goes into this corporation, to that bank account, to that shelf company, to this bank account. And it's like, it goes to my foreign one, back to my domestic one. So how is anybody gonna trace what money really went where? And for what purpose, right? If I have a glass of water and then you have a big pool of water or a big jug of water rather, and you grab my glass and you throw it in your uh, jug of water and now our waters are mixed. And then you go around and you pour it in like 10 different cups. And then you hand me back the jug that has this much water left in it. And you're like, hey, here's your water back. And I'm, I'll be like, what do you mean? How can I know that that's the water that was in my cup? You know, it all got mixed. And you're like, oh, don't worry. I poured it appropriately in each cup so that only the water that I previously had went in those cups. Here's your water back. 
And like, I have no way of disproving you. I, you know what I mean? It's, it's all conjecture. And this is how they play the game with money is that if you, if you move it around enough and in certain ways, everything is a new transaction. And so it constitutes a whole new reason for the transaction, which you can say is anything. So like we, if we want to regulate the financial industry to prevent these kinds of collusions, it's going to take some real big time thinkers who can come up with the right uh, protections and restrictions on how, how many bank accounts you can have or how many shelf companies you can have. There's going to have to be at some point regulation on that stuff in some way, because otherwise we're kind of just allowing this society to run rampant where people can launder money freely with no, basically no consequence because it's virtually impossible to prove it. Yeah. Basically the game that top companies in each industry play, whether we're talking about like the pharmaceutical industry or we're talking about the food industry or we're talking about the banks, they're basically just like, look, this is going to be so profitable that we'll just take the fines. Yeah, totally. And so that's where we're at now is like, look at the stuff with the vaccine injuries and stuff, right? Or like putting out um, like stuff with like Oxycontin or like fentanyl or whatever, like like massive uh, lawsuits, right? Monsanto. Ozempic. <laughs> yeah, whatever it is, massive lawsuits. And they're like, yeah, but we made, you know, 150 times that. So it is what it is. So yeah. part of it is like, yeah, what you're speaking to is that incentives drive behavior, Right. If you're if you're trying to think in terms of systems, whether you're you're a parent and you're trying to figure out your eight year olds, you know, just really not listening and you're trying to figure out how am I going to improve this kid's life? Incentives drive behavior or whether you're literally the leader of the free world and you're trying to figure out how to manage, you know, eight billion incentives drive behavior. And so we have to look at the current incentives and ask like, are, is the current system yep. incentivized to discourage this type of behavior? Well, we have to look at what happens when they do it. Some fines if they get caught. So it's like, that's where we're at. And for these, you know, this fourth turning and shifting into the next, whatever the next hundred year cycle is going to be, that's going to be a big piece of it is restructuring incentives because the yes. current incentives are broken for every system. That's yeah. the only reason these things haven't solved themselves, haven't taken care of themselves. It's not an intelligence issue. It's not a resources issue. Mm -mm. It's not a, oh, it's too difficult of a problem issue. We have one man taking us to Mars. You think this is more complicated than taking us to Mars? <laughs> Like, They'd like you to on. think it is. So it's like, well, the incentives. And that's where I, dis I, I really describe it akin to coming off of hard drugs. Mm. We will have to, as a, as a race, we will have to come off of this certain way of doing things, which we could call almost like easy, easy mode. The game's been on easy mode. Just like, you know, the government endlessly printing, we've been on easy mode. Eventually, that needs to get, the band-aid has to get ripped off. We all know that. We have to come off of that system. But it's going to be serious withdrawal when we do. And there's 20 to 30% inflation. Gas is $10. <laughs> but it, something has to shift, right? So it's like, it's this weird thing where I think those who are in those positions are like almost probably at this point are like, well, we're doing them a favor because if we were to shift these systems, like they would hate it for the, in the short term, but it's a necessary shift. And, um, I don't have much to add other than that, other than, um, this guy's a incredible researcher in that video. And, um, I'm very familiar with all the, you know, the fraud that city and the banks do in terms of yeah consumer debt and stuff like that, you know, like violating consumers and all that stuff like the OCC. That's, you know, that's a bureau just like the um, attorney general and CFPB and some of these, some of these entities that uh, my students will be familiar with because these are the entities you're often dealing with to enforce federal consumer law when the banks don't comply in regards to um, 
discharging debt or challenging the validity of debt or credit repair or whatever. But I hadn't before seen a whole rabbit trail uh, of yeah a money laundering. <laughs> so that's super interesting. And that's exactly the game that the 1% play. That's mm -hmm. That's exactly how you protect your money. Offshore, holding companies, all that stuff. But yeah. to just blatantly see that that's being done for like money that's obviously tied to Mexican cartels and stuff like that, and then <laughs> that's our wild. and then our government will be like that's our enemy, and it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's it's definitely an interesting thing, and and it comes back to this notion of like there's not one they, it's the enemy of maybe a certain department at this moment in time or a certain a certain they, but then there's others who are like mm, the money's too good, this isn't my enemy right now. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. but it will be mm -hmm. my enemy in like 10 years but right now is money's too good so we're gonna shake hands so it's a uh, it's interesting if you liked this clip and you want to watch another one that we think you'll love click right here if you want to watch the full episode click right here we'll see you next time